quality control consultants or the IQACs, independent quality assurance consultants has been introduced by the government of India as well as by various state governments. I would not say that it has been perfected, otherwise none of you in the, this session today would have complained about poor quality. But yes, we have seen 60 to 70 percent success and the comments are on the right track as far as quality controls are concerned. The mechanisms <coughs> are being put in place in contracts. The obligations of independent quality consultants are being well defined. They are being selected in a transparent manner through bidding processes. <coughs> I, I am quite optimistic about it that next 5 to 10 years we should see improvement in quality of projects and work by the governments is being done in the right direction. The third point was uh, by the gentleman here regarding uh, reliance and I mean if there is a from a legal point of view private sector company but because there is majority share holding by the public at large, it's a listed company, should it not be classified as a public project if Reliance is participating? I would like to really applaud him for that. He has raised a very valid point today and we all need to think about it. It's a very important point. I'm not in a position to answer it right away, but yes, prima facie, what we say is there's a lot of merit in it. We need to be thinking about it. There is just one Ambani or one uh, private individual who is controlling the entire company but most of the investors are public, the public at large and then he is entering into a PPP contract with the government on the other hand. So we need to start thinking about it, that it is a very valid point. The fourth one was if Europe can do it and we have so many dignitaries and well meaning and learned people in the government in India, why we can't do things in India? I would say it is not so. I mean, even in Europe, everything is not rosy. I have traveled to a number of European countries as a part of government delegation, interacted with the nodal ministries in charge of infrastructure. Believe me, we are at a stage now wherein India can teach Europe how to do PPPs. The availability payments model which is being implemented all across the Europe is not at all appropriate. They are going through the recession, still they are doing that project. What they basically do is, I will tell you very, very quickly, a private entrepreneur comes and constructs a uh, school. The government assures him a payment for 30 years or 50 years if he makes that school available for public. Someone constructs a road, government assures him a availability payment, annual availability payment for making that road available to the public for the next 50 years. So, in a way, it's a deferred payment which effectively costs the government much more. Rather than doing the availability payment thing, government should just pay the contractor, get the facility constructed and engage a separate OM operator. So it could be a very lengthy discussion, but I mean everything is not well with Europe or everything is not well with the way they are implementing the projects. Uh, well, just uh, my concluding comments in a minute because we've run out of time. The critical aspect that we see is how to structure concessionaire agreements in terms of period. I think the, con the consensus appears to be for not too long periods where cost is capitalized by the private initiative. Uh, maybe 30 to 50 years would be more realistic. In terms of technology, we should use the best modeling technology, look at uh, peak direction loads, look at the you know, direction loads when there's lowest amount of traffic, and do projections. It has to be calibrated with the economic cycle. Uh, in terms of legal frameworks, it's good to put in everything, including whether you want to get free passes, or there are going to be losses, or like the road the gentleman was suggesting, which has very low, uh, high social <laughs> benefits, but low viability, then it should be built into the project. And the economic uh, gap, viability gap, is the instrument by which government can give free court one court of appeal uh, because we need that breakaway point in between the regulator and the final court. So these are some of the directions the discussion is taking. Uh, I would say that it is a very interesting discussion. We should guard against, you know, capitalizing real estate and giving that benefit. So public interest should be guarded and a good return after meeting the costs should be given for private initiative because despite 
all the revenues that the government has, the need for building the country and taking it to the 21st century, the need for having a knowledge economy and competing with other great competitors like China, we need public-private partnerships, and it is partnerships across this room, the partnerships of knowledge, which will help us to design better concessionary agreements. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, sorry for interruption. Now, Dr. Rajesh Nirvana wants to speak to me. I just an officer who was SDM in Gautar in 1978, uh, 79, I, and I used to edit English nightly called Social Sage, and because that was emergency. So I used to get <coughs> Mr. Anand's clearance, not only from Rotak but from his uh, flat in Kakarnagar. So I'm very happy, although I always used to keep a track about his promotions and all, but I was I am able to meet him, I think, after <coughs> 79 today. So I am very much delighted when our, my friend Mr. Gaganan told that he will invite Mr. Ajit Jim Anand. So I was overwhelmed and I am very happy to meet him today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Then it was uh, said it would be 10 minutes, then it was reduced to 6 minutes, and now I learned that I have already met at my disposal. So I hope I will be able to cover quite a few points which I have noted down. And uh, no further ado, let me start. You see, uh, where your international terrorism and threat to global security and peace is concerned. One can say that the law can ban terrorism, it can declare terrorists as outlaws, but that by itself does not in any way reduce terrorism or end terrorism. They remain a very potent force. In fact, I believe that like crime and criminals, terrorism and terrorists have come to stay in this world. In fact, we have had terrorism from times ago in Memorial. Of course, it's another matter that some persons treat terrorists as freedom fighters and martyrs and others treat them as terrorists militants, extremists who are waging war against society, against a nation, against a country, in fact against very humanity itself. To deal with terrorism worldwide, we need to look at its causes, its growth and the measures to curb it. I do not use the word to eradicate it because as I said, I think we will be with terrorism for a long time. We may be able to weaken it. We may be able to reduce the rate at which terrorism grows or develops. But to eliminate it, I think, is a distant dream, especially in the present times. In this modern age, the yawning gap between developed and developing countries provides a fertile ground for extremist terrorists to propagate terrorism amongst impressionable minds. The youth are made to feel a sense of deprivation, exploitation and an inferiority complex by developed countries notwithstanding their advocacy of human rights. In fact, you may have noticed that in all these acts of terrorism which we have seen near our country, in our country, the age group of the terrorists has been mostly below 30, 35 years. In fact, in the Mumbai incident, when the terrorists had attacked three iconic buildings, I was leading the LSU operation. And all the ter terrorists who were, either one of them was apprehended and nine were killed, they were all below 30 years of age. So, there is a particular age group of youth on which I think we need to give attention. Problem areas and issues between different countries exist in one form or the other almost everywhere on the globe. You can put your finger anywhere and you will find that there is some difference either with the neighbor on one side or the other or with some other countries on various grounds. Such an environment, especially between neighboring countries in a region, tends to vitiate the atmosphere unless the leaders on both sides exercise restraint and sanity. More often than not, such an atmosphere results in growth of suspicion, fear, mistrust, aggression, and threatening stances and all in all, tension and sharp hostility. Jingoism and broad hysteria further, further encourage the terrorist elements in exploiting the situation. We have seen what happened when the Mumbai incident occurred. At that time there was a, almost you know, a feeling in the nation that we need to attack the neighboring country, finish off the 